Hi all. In the last video we talked about the kinematic equations that are related to motion and now we're going to talk about how you uh, change in motion. So um, when you do linear motion um, the next thing you typically learn after kinematics is uh, Newton's second law. It's F equals ma. And the important consequence of that is that a force is needed to cause an acceleration. So if I want to change the velocity of something or have it start moving I need to apply a force. The equivalent, um, there's an equivalent thing that happens when it comes to rotation. I need, I need something to start the rotation or to change the angular velocity of something. And we call that torque. We usually use the Greek letter tau, this is tau, to represent torque. And torque, I'm going to write down a formula. Um, it, well, first it's a vector. That means it has both... It has both a magnitude and direction. The direct the we're not going to worry about the direction. We'll worry about the direction a little bit, but mostly the computation is around magnitude. So we'll talk about each of those pieces separately. So the magnitude of the torque vector is equal to I'll write the formula here. Sine theta. It's a force and it's a r, which we call, the, uh, which is a distance. So let's talk about a, an example of of how we get something to rotate. Suppose I have a seesaw, and it's balanced very evenly um, on here. So I I balanced something perfectly on a point. It's not falling this way or that way. It's perfectly balanced, and I want to cause it to rotate. So rotating being like either clockwise or counterclockwise, like this. Okay. Now, um, one thing I can do is apply a force here. That would cause it to rotate counterclockwise like this, right? Or I could apply a force over here upward. Either of these would cause this thing to rotate counterclockwise, okay? And similarly, the opposite direction vectors would also do that. Now, the other thing that matters is sort of like, um, it's not just the for applying a force. It's also where I'm applying that force. Because you see, on this side, upward forces would cause it to go counterclockwise. And on, on left of the pivot point, um, uh, downward forces would cause it to go counterclockwise. Additionally, it's also easier to turn the further away. Like, I don't know if you've ever tried to remove, um, unscrew a bolt from your tire. But if you try to do it with just your hands, you'll find that it's really hard. Even if it's a, a, a small, even if you have a tool to, to clamp it and you try to rotate it, it's going to be pretty hard. Usually, to unscrew it, you have a long lever, and the longer the 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 bar is, the easier it is to rotate. Okay, so there's some notion of like how long or how far away that I'm doing the force that makes it easier or makes it more likely to turn than than not. Okay. So, um, let's talk about how we calculate the actual torque. It's related to two vectors. So first, I want to define two vectors. One is the force vector here, okay, like this one. This is an example of a force vector that would cause a torque. The r vector is the distance from the point or axis of rotation. From where the rotating is happening, I draw a vector called r. And theta refers to the angle that's between these two vectors, okay? So let's kind of read what this formula tells me. This tells me I take the length of this vector times the length of this vector times sine theta. Now, if they're already perpendicular to each other, and like if theta is 90 degrees, and they're already right angles, then this equals the magnitude of r. I just multiply the length of the two vectors directly. Okay, and this is an important consequence because what causes something to rotate is the direction of the force and where the force is being applied. For example, if I had this seesaw and I applied a force, say, in this direction, horizontally, it would not cause this thing to rotate. This would cause no torque. Okay, so there's an aspect that the vector must be perpendicular. So let's let's do, I want I want to delve into this equation a little bit more just just to make sure we fully understand because this is an important consequence for calculating torque. Suppose I now have a torque vector that's this way. 
okay? My R vector is like this. This is my force vector. This is my R vector. And now my theta is between here and here. What, F, what this sine theta, the way you think of it, is I, I break up my force vector into two component vectors. One component this way and one component, say, this way. Okay, and f sine theta refers to this. This side is f sine theta. Okay, so another way to think of it, which is, well, I tend to not use this equation. I tend to think of it this way. I'm looking for the force, the portion of the force vector that's already perpendicular to my r vector, and I want to multiply those magnitudes together. Okay, so I'll say that one more time just to be clear. I want to take the portion of the force vector that's perpendicular to the r vector and multiply the two. Remember, the force vector is just the force being applied like your free body diagram as usual. And the r vector refers to the, the vector from the point of rotation to where the force is being applied. Force vector. The r vector is vector from point of rotation to where F is applied. So I always want to take those two vectors and only multiply them when they're perpendicular, or take the perpendicular portion and multiply them. Okay, So that is how I calculate torque. Um, now what do we do with that? Oh, sorry. Uh, I want to talk about uh, direction. So that's magnitude of the torque. So let's talk a little bit about direction of torque. In AP Physics 1, we're not going to delve into the complexities of the, the torque vector direction. Okay. If you, if you do, if some of you are taking AP Physics C or you're taking a more advanced physics class or uh, mechanics class, um, the direction is, is, is done differently. But for AP Physics 1, all you really need to understand is <clears throat> when something is rotating, we establish a direction, one di either clockwise or counterclockwise, you know, the, sort of the direction of rotation of where the things are. Okay. And by convention, we typically do counterclockwise as the positive direction. It's kind of like, you know, when you do the vectors in the X and Y direction, you typically do X's, positive X is in the uh, horizontal direction, positive Y is in the... But it doesn't have to be. You can flip them, right? As long as you are consistent in your directions, you can you can flip things around. So counterclockwise is positive rotation. Uh, clockwise is negative rotation. So then you associate each force vector as to whether or not it's going to be applying a positive or negative torque based on the direction that it would cause it to rotate. So this one here is a negative torque. Because it would this force is causing it to move clockwise. Similarly, this is a positive torque because this would cause it to move counterclockwise, and this force would be a negative torque here because it is also causing it to move counterclockwise. And as a as another point, maybe a force vector here, right at the point of rotation. It's worth noting that this torque would be zero because, <clears throat> because the vector, the R vector would be length zero because from the point of rotation to where it's being applied, the torque is zero. So that's another important point. The torque can be zero for a couple of reasons. One, that the R vector is zero because it's acting at the point of rotation or because the, the force vector is parallel to the R vector, in which case, like in... Um, this scenario up here, where the force vector is parallel to the r vector, the r vector being, you know, here. Because they're parallel, when I multiply them together, like theta zero, so sine of zero is zero, right? Okay. So the last thing to put this together is, okay, so now we know how to calculate torque. What does torque have to do? Newton's second law, kind of like in um, linear motion, where you do F equals MA, you do a net force on your free body diagram, you set it equal to mass times acceleration. Here, you would do a net torque 
and you would set it equal to i times alpha, where alpha is angular, is again angular acceleration. Now this i is rotational inertia. That's what we call it. And we're not going to talk about it yet. A later video will get into exactly what rotational inertia means. But for now, um, you don't need to worry about it. So the net torque is equal to the rotational inertia times alpha. And this is analogous to the linear motion, F equals ma. So torque is like force. Angular acceleration is like linear acceleration. Those are analogous. Okay. So um, in the next video, we're going to start looking at statics. And that's the case where the net torque is zero or nothing is moving or rotating.